Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and you're watching the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today we're going to be talking with Julie Lee, who um, is a flower photographer, and she's amazing. The Understand Photography Show is a podcast, it's a YouTube show, and we also broadcast on Facebook. It comes out at 4 p.m. Eastern Time every single Friday, so for almost three years now, or about three years now, depending on when this airs, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you like this episode, go back and watch some other ones. Uh, please leave us a review on iTunes. That is the most helpful thing you could do for us. We really appreciate it. Understand Photography is a training center and our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So we try to do that in many different ways. We offer classes here in Naples, Florida. We offer trips all over the world. Um, we have online classes and we have a couple of Facebook groups. So if you just want some free help, we're there to help you. Go to our Facebook page, it's facebook.com slash understand photography and scroll down where it says groups. We have one that's called the Understand Photography Group and that's for general questions we share. Joe Fitzpatrick started something called Monochrome Mondays and Wildlife Wednesdays so you can share pictures, you can ask questions, you know, wh what should I do, my lens isn't focusing, things like that, anything. What kind of camera should I buy? All that kind of stuff, you can ask those kind of questions. The other group we have is called Selling Your Photography as Art. And that is geared towards the marketing and sales process of us photographers, we photographers, I'm not sure, anyway, who want to sell our photography. So how do I get started? How do I get into a gallery? Um, what should my website have on it? Just all those types of questions and things like that. So that's, those are to our two Facebook groups. Uh, today my guest is Julie Lee and Julie's been on the show before so you know she's going to be good or we don't invite them back, right? <laughs> Julie is a professional photographer for a love of teaching workshops and leading photo tours. She has a special interest in botanic photography so that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome Julie. Thank you so much Peggy for having me back and um, last time we talked about infrared photography and Today I'm really excited. Um, flower photography really speaks from my heart. So yes, I'm very excited to be back on your show. And me, who I follow you of course on social media and yes. you have like become fanatical about the flower photography I think, <laughs> right? I have and like I said it speaks from my heart and I put out things that um, really appeal to me and it just makes me so happy when other people see my work and I find that it appeals to them as well. It brings back memories of a special flower or um, maybe in, on the teaching aspect it's something that they want to learn how to do themselves. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, and I think everyone in the whole world lo loves flowers. Look I at all the so. florist shops all yeah. over the world. Well, flowers mean happy in yeah. most situations. It's, yeah. it's, it's a happy it's a happy feeling. Yeah, yes. and they're so beautiful. So, so, so walk us through like just say I'm a rank beginner as a photographer in general and I want to start taking pictures of flowers. What do I need to learn first and what do I kind of step, step me through it? I believe the first thing you need to learn is your camera. You need to learn the settings, how moving this dial and pressing that button operates your camera. You need to learn how to adjust your exposure, how to, what uh, what aperture does from a wide open aperture to a closed down aperture, how does that affect the photo that's going to appear on the back of your camera. So knowing your camera first instead of having program mode or um, one of the other semi, I call it semi-automatic modes such as shutter priority or aperture priority. Um, so shooting in manual. And, I just, and yes. you know, I hate to interrupt you, but you know, I have a class for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, you need to take some classes with Peggy and learn how to get on manual. It, it 
is a lifesaver for me and saves me a lot of time when photographing flowers. And the thing that I think that people are kind of afraid of manual and really you only have to learn three things, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Yes. You just have to learn what those three things do, how to put them together, yes. boom, you got it. And in macro photography, also the distance between you and your subject would be a fourth variable and we can talk about that as we progress. Why don't we talk about it right now? Okay, well in, in macro photography. And when you say macro photography. That means people, close up. Okay. Close up. So you could do a macro lens. You could also use a telephoto lens and step back from your subject. But um, to get a blurry background, that's what I personally like to shoot for is the blurry background because I find that busy backgrounds will detract from my subject. Mm -hmm. I want to shoot as wide open as possible, which means um, it would be 2.8 or you know f5.6 on a telephoto lens, but on a macro lens, because they're designed to decrease the minimum focusing distance, minimum focusing distance is the distance between the front of your camera to your subject, so you're getting much closer. The wider open you are, the shallower your depth of field. So where if you're shooting with a telephoto lens, you could probably go down to 2.8 because you're going to be further away from your subject. But with a macro lens, you might be at f8 or f11 and still have a very narrow slice of focus okay. in your shot. So it okay. depends on the lens that you're using and the distance to your subject and there's a lot of variables. Well, You know what though, that's a really good subject because that is something else we were talking before the show started about my intern. Yes. And she didn't realize, she kept saying, I can't focus. I said, well, you're too close yes. for her lens. She didn't have yes. a macro lens. She can't be three inches away. She right. has to back up a little bit because yes. each lens has a a distance right. that they can focus. Right, and if focus. you pull out the documentation that came with your lens or you could even go on to the manufacturer's website, type in the lens that you have and look down to um, find its minimum focusing distance. And with my macro lens, it's about, I, I believe, four to eight inches. I think it's about four inches away from the subject, which means that it's a macro lens, but I have other lenses where I have to be 18 inches with my with my birding lens. It's a one to 400 millimeter lens, and if I'm zoomed all the way out to 400 millimeters, I might have to be six to eight feet or more away from my subject to get it to focus. Okay. So make sure that you know the minimum focusing distance of your lens. Yeah, that's that's a great tip right yep. there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of tips. <laughs> Just ask. <laughs> okay, so what do you look for in a flower that makes it photo worthy? For me, I am not a documentary photographer. Okay. I do not want to document a perfect flower. I'm looking for a flower that has character. Okay. So in a field of tulips, I'm not looking for the most perfect tulip in the field. I'm looking for the one that maybe has a, a human characteristic. Um, there's, there's actually a word for that. It's called anthropomorphism. So that's when something that is not a human um, is showing a gesture that, that has a human characteristic. So I was uh, photographing up in Wisconsin a couple weeks ago, and I found two tulips. They were not perfect, but they were intertwined, and they, they just looked like you know lovers tipping their heads together. And then that, to me, the human, the human gesture is what attracts me. So that, that is my bonanza when I go out and I find a flower that looks like that. But you know, say I'm photographing a daisy. I don't want the daisy that has the perfect petals. I want the one that maybe has a little curly Q petal. The, I want to, I'm looking for the oddball in the group, so. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for. That's that's so cute. I, I never ever would have thought of that at all. <laughs> Maybe if I was studying yeah. flowers, I would more. But I never thought about and that. And most gardeners would clip the photos or the, the photos, the um, flowers out um, in a botanic garden because they're not perfect. And there's a lady in Orlando that I buy some flowers from and she wants to give me the perfect ones. I'm like, no, give me your curvy stems, give me, give me your oddballs, give me your throwaways that you're not gonna put into the wedding bouquets. So she has a market for me in her discards. So she always calls me and says, 
I have I have some oddballs for you. Aww, <laughs> I love that. You know, it's funny that you say that because there was a lady who just tempted for me for a little while. She's a photographer in town. She's a very good photographer, and I had tulips. You know, of course, we can't grow tulips down here, so I had True. a you know, and they were but they were kind of they were cut tulips, but they were mm -hmm. kind of on their last legs, right. and they were just really starting to droop. But I didn't yeah. want to throw them away because I like tulips so much. Mm -hmm. And she took the nicest, and a cell phone. Yeah. She took the great yeah. cell phone picture of those droopy tulips, yeah. and she made it look yeah. so good. I never even thought yeah. about. I will photograph um, dead and dying flowers as well. Some of them become very translucent, and the petals will twist and turn, and I'll just let them dry and see what happens before I throw them away. And my husband is... He's like, why? Why is this sitting on the countertop? I'm like, I leave it alone. Don't throw it away. So <laughs> I have to guard my flowers. <laughs> oh my gosh! So now, okay, you said that you usually sh you shoot in the manual mode. I do. Usually, you try to shoot as with the f stop as wide open as you can, like f two point eight or one point something. Most of the time, something. yes. Mm -hmm. Are there what, what circumstances would you have a? like a greater depth of field? Well, when I go to a botanic garden, the first few shots that I like to take are when I walk into the garden, I want a scenic shot of the the whole garden. Oh. Just like I was just at Chicago Botanic Garden and I just wanted something that said, this is Chicago Botanic Garden. You know, I try to do some land, you know, composing for a nice landscape shot to just show the viewer this, this is the bounty that I'm walking into. And so I like the overall shot okay. and then I'll move in. So I usually start wide and then I move in and then I find my leading ladies. That's what I call leading the, ladies. the leading ladies are usually my subject. And then I move around the flowers and try to find the best side of the leading lady, but have some supporting actors in the back. So okay. I, I keep this story in my head. Here's my leading lady, what's her story? And it might be a color of a supporting actor that, that amplifies her story. Um, so maybe I have a yellow flower, so I'm looking for a blue flower for the background because that's part of the color story. They're um, opposite each other on the color wheel, so I'm looking for the contrasting or complementary okay. colors to bring out my leading lady with uh, a supporting actor. So. so first you look, so first you do overall and you're going to do that F8 or F11 or something like that? Yeah, F11 is pretty a pretty good spot to start. And then you, go to, then you start looking for the leading lady. Yes. <laughs> and then you start playing with your settings. Yes. You could be yes. going depending on the background. Mm -hmm. I guess you could have a sharp background or a blurry background, right? I try to find a back, uh, my supporting actors that are a little bit away okay. from so my they subject. can be softer. So that they become supporting actors than multiple no. leading ladies. Okay, yes. okay. Because it's just a distraction because it draws the eye away from the star of the show. Okay, and do you have a favorite lens that you use for? For that type of? I have. Now, obviously, you're going to use a wider lens for the overall shot, right? Yes, or I stand very far back with my macro lens because it will focus to infinity, but I have to stand pretty far back. Okay. So sometimes I walk in with one camera, one lens, and I find that I become much more creative when I limit myself. Because you're not packed Holy. down like a exactly. mule. Exactly. <laughs> and I find I don't carry tons of gear anymore. I don't do it. And if, if I'm doing a workshop, then if I've got gear, I bring my small airport navigator bag by Think Tank, and it will have maybe a ex couple extra camera bodies with other um, lenses that I use for botanical photography. And then I can just pull it out, and I'm not in there switching lenses all the time. But that bag is on wheels. So it's a beautiful thing to have it on wheels. But I just I don't carry it on my back anymore it kills the creativity for me yeah that's i think that's good advice too right there <laughs> because it's so hard for me because i want everything with me but i don't want to carry it yeah. <laughs> but if you're local or if you know you're coming back several days in a row just just, do just one take lens. one do one lens yeah. or if you have a shoulder bag put one other lens 
in there, but limiting yourself will, number one, it'll teach you every single thing that you can do with that lens. And by the time you go home, you'll know all the creative options for that one lens. Oh, yeah. I knew a golfer once that I worked for um, a golf course at one time, and the golf pro who would take me out for some free lessons after work would say to learn the clubs in your bag, play nine holes with one club, play nine holes with a putter so that you know how far you can putt, how short, how to chip with that. And then the next time you go out, play nine holes with another, you know, with a driver. And then you learn the, the minimum and maximum capabilities of what you're carrying with you. And the same goes for lenses. Yeah. Huh, I like it. I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> I, sure do. You can. <laughs> I can just think about yeah. like you know we do the old Naples photo tour here every right. Monday during season mm -hmm. and Brian usually does them but you know Brian's mother was sick one mm -hmm. year and so Joe and I were going I would do one one week and Joe would do the next week and I doing the same thing every week was very difficult for me <laughs> and to, to get a different shot I just yeah. was bored yeah. I was bored. I just was really bored. Mm -hmm. I like to teach, but I like to mm -hmm. teach in different spots, not in the same tour every time. Right. And uh, well, you could also create so, challenges for yourself. Well, that's what so. I did. I just forced myself. Yes. I brought a different lens or a yeah. different camera every mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. and it made made it more fun for me. Or you might do a different theme. That you know, this one could be abstract. Yeah. I'm not taking pictures of things. I'm taking pictures about things. So it might be a lamp post with you know, the edge of a building or the reflection of something in a pane of glass or you know, just give yourself a, a challenge yeah, for each yeah. photo walk. But what I, what I was saying though with the lenses is I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just going to use my 150 to 600 on this tour. It's a city okay. tour. So that's a really, yeah. really the wrong lens to have with you, but it was fun. Mm -hmm. But still, if I was going to only be there one time, mm -hmm. I would really want my wide lens there, you know? Yeah. Or you could, I have a walkabout lens. That's what I call it, a walkabout lens. It goes from 18 millimeters up to 135. Oh, that's and that nice. way I can get the wide that's and then nice I can range. zoom in. I could, I could go at 135 and shoot down an alleyway and get compression of all the buildings stacked up. Is that a Nikon lens? It's a Fuji lens. Oh, I shoot Fuji, Fuji now. Oh, because, yeah. yeah, that's a nice range. Yeah, 18. It's a walkabout lens. Nikon has one that is, I believe it's a 24 to 120. It's the one that they pair with camera bodies if you buy them as a kit. And that's a wonderful lens if you shoot like Nikon. Yeah. I'm a Canon shooter and I've got a 20 24 to 105. Yeah. But that's not a really good range. I mean, it's nice and wide. It's mm -hmm. not, not wide enough, though. When I went to Paris, it yeah. wasn't nearly wide enough with, on a full frame. Mm -hmm. So... I wish I would have had 10 lenses with me. That's my problem. <laughs> All right, so how do you add, let's go to lighting. How do you, how do you, okay, so obviously you're out, let's say at a botanical garden. Mm -hmm. What do you do about lighting? Do you I go pray. at a certain time of day? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I show up early and I pray for it to be overcast, but not windy. That, that is the ideal situation okay. for flower photography because it's like a giant diffuser above my head, you, the colors are more saturated. Um, I'm not having to carry extra equipment like a diffuser to beat down the harsh sun on the bloom. So yes, overcast, not windy, that would be a perfect situation. But early in the morning, uh, late in the afternoon when you get the golden light, that's really nice. Sometimes I'll position myself so the light is to the right or the left. So if it's to the right or the left, the light is going to be more dramatic. So if mm -hmm. my subject has a lot of texture to it or lots of petals to it, it, it's about the light and shadow and how it plays off the texture of the flower. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's kind of a monotone, smooth, petaled flower, I might want front lighting or backlighting. I, I'd love to do backlighting. Okay. with my blooms too. In that case, I would use a reflector to get some light back. You know, the sun is behind my 
here's flower. the sun, here's my flower, and then I reflect light back onto the face of the flower. That and you way. just would only need a small reflector, yeah, like right? A, I get, they have and a 10 inch or 12 or inch silver. 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 Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, the I gold will give a gold tint. Yeah, the gold will I know, I'm will not discolor. a gold reflector kind no, of person. I'm people either. No, I'm, no, I'm just don't like, like an I unnatural never liked suntan. Them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. So, do you carry one of those reflectors that has the diffuser inside of it, too? I have a 5 in 1. I have a 24 inch 5 in 1. So, you get the black, white, diffuser, silver, and gold. I usually take everything off of it and just carry the diffuser part of it. But I found one that has a handle built into it. So there's a little a little oh. cutout with a handle and I can actually hold, put my hand through the handle and hold the right side of my camera with my left hand under the lens. And when I'm getting up close to a flower, then um, you know, my diffuser is right there and I don't have to rely on someone else. That sounds yeah. nice. Did you get that on Amazon? I did. Okay. If Heather can find the link, we're going to put that okay, great, link in great. the show notes. Yes, I actually <laughs> refer my workshop participants to that diffuser. Oh, so you know it's the nice. link. Okay. Yes. You can yeah, I have send it. it to us and we'll put it yes. right in the show notes for, yes. our, for our viewers, listeners, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> audience. <laughs> what about, um, do you ever use flash? Only in my office. So we're in the heat of summer right now, and it's probably my least favorite time to be in a botanic garden. Mm -hmm. um, photographing with sweat dripping into my eyes is not my thing. <laughs> I, I just wear out so quickly. If I can't get in at 7 o'clock in the morning, and, and you know, most of the gardens, they, they don't, don't open, open until 9 o'clock, yeah. unless you can get special permission. I haven't been that lucky with that <laughs> part. but. Um, yeah, summer is not not my favorite time for photos here in Florida, but I will go to Trader Joe's and they have a fantastic selection of flowers that are relatively inexpensive and I always try to get them in a pot of dirt because they last longer, but if I have to get cut flowers, I'll do that and I'll take them into my office and set up a little mini studio. It doesn't take much room at all to set up in a studio and I have a big beautiful well-lit window in there so I can use window light. I have some studio lights. I'll use LEDs. Um, I have a light pad that I'll lay flowers on top of for high key images. So I've got the light coming from the back and then I'll shine some more light um, on the top or use a reflector and reflect it back up, down onto That's them. That's cool. Yeah. You'll have to give me a link for that one, too. Sure, sure. That sounds Amazon. really cool. I know, I <laughs> yeah. love Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. And now, you know, now I can just say, Alexa, order something. I don't even have to. Oh. <laughs> it's terrible. It's too easy to shop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds really, really yeah. cool, though. Especially, you're right, it's so hot here in the summer, and it rains in the afternoon. Yes. And it sounds like a nice project. Now, I went to a workshop in, um, I was one of the speakers at the, Southwest, it's Swimsy, Southwest Michigan Camera okay. Club Conference, let's say. Okay. Let's say that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And it's going to kill me because I can't remember the woman's name. And she, she did a presentation with the Lens Babies okay. and then, you know, let, she had a whole case of them that you could borrow to try the Lens Babies out. And she had stations all around the room with a flower, two flowers in a vase. Mm -hmm. And she had like about the size of poster boards. They were thicker though. Mm -hmm. And she had like, I don't know if it's like wallpaper or kind of blown up right. pictures. So they were like blurry backgrounds, but they they weren't. You could yeah. shoot them in, with your cell phone and it looked like you were shooting a flower right. with a blurry background. It was a really yeah. cool so, idea. Yes, I, I never that. knew that. I never yes. saw that before. So any any of your viewers can go out into a garden or, or a forest or into their backyard. And what you do is you take a picture that is out of focus. And it can be, it can be flowers in your yard. You can, what you do is you look for color and light. So find the color and light that you want, set your aperture to 2.8 and take a photo out of focus. And if you've got, if, it, if your camera won't take a photo out of focus, you need to go into your settings, 
and I'm, you know, every camera manufacturer is different, but there will be a place where it's either turned on or off to allow your camera to, yes, take a photo out of focus or no. Because I have had some issues on workshops teaching this technique that I'm going to tell you about. Okay. They can't take, it won't click. Their camera will not click because they had the setting turned on to where they couldn't take a photo out of focus. They can't just put your lens in uh, manual focus? Um, no, it, it overrode it. Oh, oh. It overrode it. Okay. So it was a setting inside the camera menu. So, okay. so what I used to do is what you did at the Michigan Camera Club conference. I took um, phone core board and I took my out of focus photo, printed it on matte paper and it's very important that you do matte paper so that you don't get a reflection. Oh right. Yeah so you print it on matte paper and I just use the spray glue the 3M makes a nice spray glue and I just glue it to the um, foam core. Sometimes I would take that to a botanic garden because the flowers are all packed in together and I couldn't yeah. you know I couldn't get a clean background so I'd have somebody hold that or oh, I, would, yeah. I would use a Wimberley plamp P-L-A-M-P, that's something else to look up. I would have that um, device holding my foam core behind me, but now I take the f blurry photo and then I take my sharp photo of my flower and I combine them in Photoshop. Okay. And then I'm not carrying around foam core because I'm becoming the lazy photographer. I don't want to carry weight. I don't want to have gear, you know, shoved under my arms and tromping through a botanic garden with all of my stuff. So. You yeah, know, it's, it's just a file on my That's camera. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. But it's idea. nice if you're doing a, a workshop in a conference room, it gives you that nice. Yeah, I mean, because we background. could all go around the whole room. Mm -hmm. There were like, she had like, like I'm yeah. going to say like 15 different setups maybe. Yeah. So it was plenty of room for everybody to take turns and kind of go through and try the different flowers on the different backgrounds. Yeah. It was a good idea. Yeah. And I had heard that people do it with black too, just a black. Yeah, you can use black or, velvet because it's not reflective or a black backdrop. That's what I use at home. Okay. I actually took a black backdrop and cut a small piece out and I just tack it to the drywall and and there it is. That, that was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my studio is, is very tiny for shooting flowers. Yeah, you don't need much. Yeah. I think anybody could do it. Now, what if, if the lighting is really um, maybe harsh or you have different colored like whites and dark flowers together? Do you use HDR at all? Like do you bracket? I do not bracket. Well, I don't set bracketing on my camera. I, but again, I shoot in manual and I have, I know my camera. I can, I can manipulate my camera in a dark closet with my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And so on Fuji, the aperture is changed with my left hand. It's actually on the lens. I've programmed the front button to change my ISO up and down. Mm -hmm. And then I've um, programmed my back scroll button to do my shutter speed. Okay. And so what I'll do instead of instead of you know looking at the top of my camera and switching it to bracketing, I'll just leave it on single shot and um, I try to use the lowest ISO possible and the, the flower that I'm shooting will determine the aperture that I'm using and then I'll use my shutter speed to change the, the lighting. So I try to shoot to the right, which you've probably um, instructed people, um, this is in reference to a histogram, mm -hmm. to sh use your histogram, especially in live view. If you're shooting mirrorless, you can have it on your um, screen as you're shooting. I can see my histogram through my viewfinder and on the screen on the back of my camera. I use it all the time mm -hmm. so that I know that I'm not blowing out any pixels. Okay. And I will brighten my scene till my histogram gets all the way to the right and just before I get a spike okay. so that I know that I'm not blowing out pixels. So I have a very bright photo to start with. And okay. then I, in Lightroom, I can just darken it down. Okay. And in Lightroom, if you do the um, selective adjustments, instead of, I always start with global, but then I go into the selective adjustments and I might keep my white flowers white, but I'll darken down my dark flowers. But I never 
never shoot dark and try to bring up the light because that introduces a lot of noise. unwanted grain yeah. noise. Yeah, actually, um, I don't remember the, the episode number, but Satesh Ramjatan, how's that? Okay. Satesh, I got your name right. <laughs> anyway, Satesh was a guest the second time because he's been on twice. But our whole show was on exposing to the right. Yes. That was the great. entire show. So if great. somebody really wants to know what we're talking about, watch that show with Satesh. Yes, that's, that has been a life changer for me. I, I learned about it probably five, six, seven years ago. And even when I'm shooting sunrise or sunset, I have my histogram to the right. And I am not concerned with the um, image that appears in image review on the back of my camera. The only thing I'm concerned about is that my histogram is not blown on the right and I can always darken it back down because all of those colors are there. The file size is bigger. It has so much more information in it than if I had shot it dark. Yeah. And the same thing goes for flower photography. Okay, okay. It's easier so to darken. That's a great, great lesson. So yeah. instead of bracketing or whatever, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't bracket automatically because yeah. I am such a manual shooter. I, mm -hmm. I just, you know, take, I'll take a picture, three pictures with three different exposures yes. with just not breathing. I just mm -hmm. do it with my shutter with my finger. I don't, yeah. I don't need to go in and put bracketing in and yeah. all that kind of, that seems yeah. like way too much trouble to me. I'm too yeah. lazy. Well, I think <laughs> as, you, as you learn your camera, you become more efficient. And, yeah. and like you, I just roll my shutter speed, click, roll shutter speed, click, Yeah, roll I don't have shutter. to look up or move the camera. Nope. So even without yes. a tripod, I, I can do it. What yeah. Now, do you use a tripod? Inside. Inside. Yeah, but not at the gardens. No, more stuff to carry. Exactly. I'm with you. I'm lazy, too. I like that you're lazy. <laughs> you know, I, I think it gets a smile when I when I say that. But the, the gist of lazy. it is, is I, I don't want to be a pack mule carrying every bit of gear. I'm getting rid of my big camera bags now because for the last two, three years, I've stopped carrying all my gear. I might I might have my big bag in my car to where if it's an emergency and I absolutely have to have that lens, I will walk out to the car and get the other lens. Yeah. But I'll I'll try everything I can not to have to go do that. I think that's the way everybody is feeling. Mm -hmm. We don't want to carry around that big heavy no. and I think the camera Manufacturers are listening. They're mm -hmm. just slow to, you know, to get the technology to yeah. the point where it can be lighter weight. Yeah, it's not there yeah. yet. But the weight of the gear working. takes away the joy, for me. I know. I'm so, so funny because I probably I don't know four or five years ago I sold my 70 to 200 2.8. I mm -hmm. had that lens. It was one of my first lenses. It's a wonderful lens. But I quit using it. Yeah a long time ago mm -hmm. because the thing is just so heavy. Mm -hmm. Now when I was young it didn't seem as heavy as it does now. <laughs> right. So I don't know what happened there. But <laughs> All right, so where now when you're taking flower pictures, close-ups, where do you focus? Do you focus like on the petal, on the stem, on the I don't know the words, pistol, all that kind of stuff? Do you so, like I said before, I'm looking for a flower with character okay. or that's making a gesture. And so that is going, I have this little conversation in my head is, why do I want to photograph this flower? Is oh, I, I like the way the petals turn. Well, that right there is the answer to where I'm going to put oh. my focus point. And knowing how okay. to, I use single spot or single point focusing and I use um, um, spot metering. I don't want to meter the whole scene like you would in a landscape photo. I want my flower metered perfectly, and if the background blows out, that's fine with me. I might add a text, like a colored texture or something behind it, but I want my flower to be exposed properly without all of the background you know, mixing in with that metering. Mm -hmm. So spot metering, and then I do single point focus, and I move the focus point around on my screen to where that little gesture is on the flower, and that's when I take my shot. I don't, I don't leave it in the center and do the focus and recompose because that's disastrous in macro yeah, photography. Yeah, you don't have the, you don't have the, like I could do that in portrait photography, but not when you're talking about macro. Right. So you actually compose the picture, then you move the focus then point. Then I move the focus point, okay. and then I take the shot. Okay. And then sometimes, if if there's other interesting bits of the flower that I might want to bring into focus when I'm sitting at my desk at home, then while I'm still out in the field, 
I'll put the focus point on the gesture, take that shot, and then I'll move the focus point maybe to the center of the flower if it's beautiful. I'll take a shot there and I'll move the focus point to different parts of the flower and capture those. Now I may just end up throwing those away, but at least I have different pieces of the flower in focus and then I can just um, put them all as layers in Photoshop and brush in the focus where I want it. So when you do your focus stacking, that, you're doing it with just layers in Photoshop. You're not using yes. any of those fancy softwares that do the I blending. I have them. I, I use that if I'm on a tripod in my home and the lighting okay. is consistent. Those photos are interesting because you can get really close to a flower and get the really fine details, but I find they, the flowers don't speak to my heart. That those flowers are more documentary okay. style versus, I don't find anything creative mm -hmm. in the, the focus stacking technique. But, but there are mm -hmm. some, some good programs out there that um, Fujifilm actually has focus stacking built into the menu system. So I can take 100 shots and it moves millimeters throughout the flower. And then I put it into a, I think it's called Zareen Stacker. There's different ones out there. Helicon Focus, oh, yeah, Zareen that was the one Stacker. That somebody recommended. The one that I have is free. Um, I'm a Windows user, uh -huh. so um, it's it's real basic. I'm not gonna, I barely do focus stacking at all. So the free one is, Plenty. it's everything that I need. Okay. Yeah. But it's a documentary photo. So. Yeah, yeah. That was it's more okay. for maybe the, the macro photographers who are into bugs. Bugs. Well, <laughs> they like the bugs, bugs, is, bugs to if be they're, sharper. Yeah, <laughs> if they're dead and they're pinned to a board, but bugs typically move. Oh, yeah, they move, move don't they? Yeah. I don't yeah. like to photograph bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I keep dragon, dragonflies and butterflies. Oh, that's but they're true. usually Those on the flowers. Are bugs, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. But they're pretty. I, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I guess some bugs are pretty. Somebody on our Facebook group today put uh, a couple pictures of praying mantises, and they were oh, really, really cool pictures. Yeah. yeah, so I guess yeah. bugs are okay. They have cute gestures sometimes. Like, and you can go to a garden store, and the garden store in Orlando that I go to, you can buy cocoons with praying mantis take them home and just tie it onto your fence or somewhere in your garden because they eat the bad bugs. And then little baby praying mantises will hatch and spread throughout your garden. You can do the same thing with ladybugs, but you could buy a mesh bag full of ladybugs. So if you want, if you want <laughs> a ladybug on your flowers, <laughs> go to your local garden center. Um, not the, you know, not the big box stores, Depot, but your, but yeah, like the, yeah, like the, the we family have drift, owned. Driftwood here is there our, There you go. Like we have Lucas our, Nursery in yeah. Orlando and they always have praying mantis and ladybugs for sale. Oh, so that's I, a nice little addition. I did not know that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you, when you were talking about you cut the flower out and just put a different background, you do that in Photoshop, I assume? I do, yes. And I don't really cut the flower out. Okay. I just layer it with a background and using masks and white and black brushes to brush in and brush out what I want and don't want. How do you do the selection? Isn't the selection kind of hard to do? I don't select much. Okay. Um, I just layer them and use a mask and I use like paintbrush strokes um, I use, I turn the flow down on my brush to, I'm usually painting at about 2% to 5% and I start revealing the flower. Okay. So that's, ah, okay, that's, that's my mode. There's a hundred different ways to do it. And I think the one that people are most comfortable with is the way to go. Okay. So if you walk me through your post-processing. So you start in Lightroom? I start in Lightroom. I import so to Lightroom. Um, I cull the images. I'll put white flags on the ones that I want to work with. I do X's on the ones that are throw away and I delete off all of my junk first. Um, I add keywords. Um, if it's not done on import, Im on import my keywording is very generic. It might be, you know, botanic, flower, and the name of the garden that I shot in, okay. and maybe even the season of the year that I shot. That's a good idea. But then after I've thrown away the junk, I'll use the little spray can thing at the bottom 
um, in the Lightroom library module and I'll spray keywords as far as specific names of flowers. And I have smart collections that I've created in Lightroom that um, when I spray daisy on this flower, it automatically goes into my daisy smart collection. It's looking for the keyword daisy and it automatically goes in there. So later down the road, if I'm looking for a picture of a daisy, I go to the smart collection and I might have three, four different years of different daisy photos, but they're all there together. Okay, so. Joe, you're going to have to teach me how to do the spray thing. <laughs> oh, the spray <laughs> can's amazing. One of, our, one of our Tuesday tips is on that, Peggy, recently. Oh. <laughs> now, if the so. audience didn't hear, the, hear that, Joe said it's already on one of our Tuesday tips on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. Yeah, the, the spray can is, is super easy, and you can even add multiple keywords, but I, I like to separate my flowers by their type so that I can find them later. That's a great so idea. So that's just importing. But when I go into the develop module, I work with the basic panel first and I'll make sure that um, I've imported in the, I like to use the Fujifilm Velvia. Um, it's the color, color contrast. I like to use that for botanic photography. Okay. It's a little green for my taste. So next I'll go down to the white balance color sliders and I'll pull off some of the green. Um, I'll move it towards the magenta just a little bit to get that glowing green that the Velvia um, puts on there. And then I work with the exposure, the, um, exposure of a little bit. Sometimes I'll set my black and white points. I always do that for my um, for my other nature photography, not so much for flower photography, but sometimes I'll play with that. I very rarely use the contrast slider. Um, I'll go down and add maybe just a, a smidge of the clarity, but now I'm looking more at the texture. Oh yeah. The new okay. texture slider, uh -huh. but I typically, because my backgrounds are so out of focus, I don't want to do a global adjustment there. So okay. I might go into the selective adjustments and put a little bit more clarity on the gesture of the flower, what I, where I put my focus okay. point. So I'll put a little texture or clarity there. I do very little sharpening in Lightroom. Sometimes I'll do it as output sharpening, but typically I'll do that in Photoshop. So you'll go do your basic adjustments in Lightroom mm -hmm. and then you right click and say edit in Photoshop to finish off. Yes, the, yes. And what do you do in Photoshop? Photoshop? Will you do any masking, I learned. Yeah, <laughs> Photoshop is where I will layer my flowers. If I want to add a texture, that will be done in Photoshop. Sometimes I'll take multiple pictures in my location. Uh -huh. So in my, like at Ch Chicago Botanic, they have these big bronze medallions that are set into the sidewalks in a couple of the gardens. And so I might take a bunch of photos in that garden, but then I also like to have a photo of that medallion and I might layer that somewhere in the photo um, as part of a texture. So it's got bricks around it, you've got the medallion, and it tells you the name of the garden, and it's got this, you know, just raised pictures that are engraved into the medallion. And so okay. that can become a texture. So I, I have loads and loads of textures and you to use work with. The blending modes? I use blending modes, typically soft light, overlay. Those are my favorites. Okay. Sometimes if I'm going for a more dramatic effect, I'll use multiply just to get some dark and dramatic going. But overlay and soft light are my primary. I, um, you know, we when we have the ladies weekends, we mm -hmm. always teach about textures and blending mm -hmm. modes. And uh, I am really learning a lot about creativity from the students, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Some of the stuff they come up with is amazing because yeah. I look at stuff and I'm like, yeah, I don't really like that. But mm -hmm. when they do it, sometimes yeah. they do some weird things and they come out so cool. So then, of course, I'm copying them. <laughs> well, and if you're learning Photoshop and that, that moment when somebody talks to you and teaches you blending modes and, you know, adding additional layers and changing the blending mode, it's like, Oh my gosh, I didn't, I didn't know Photoshop could do that and 
Oh. Yeah, it's blending modes are wonderful. And sometimes I'll even duplicate my, I'll, I always duplicate my background layer before I do any adjustments because I want to preserve the original I image. I do exactly the same yeah. thing. I never I, do anything I, to that. If anyone has ever taken a Photoshop class from yes. me, I say, what's the first thing we do? We make a copy of the layer. <laughs> yes, yes, never, never work on your background. But sometimes I'll make a copy, I'll make several copies and I'll do a different blending mode for each layer and then blend those together or mask and oh, it's just wow. the, it, the creativity is limitless. That's so cool, yes. I gotta try that. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done that, mm -hmm. I don't know. Wow, I'm gonna try it. All right, okay. so, so we're probably a little advanced in the Photoshop and Lightroom talking for our audience, I think. Maybe not, we'll see, yeah. we'll see. Yeah, but layers, just to, layers and masks are kind of the beginning and blending modes, that's, that's what, in my opinion, that people should learn first. Yeah, yeah, okay. Stay away from the filters and all that, learn how to mask and blend. Yeah, that's right. I don't yeah. even know how to, I don't even know. I, in fact, I remember when Photoshop put the filters in there, yeah. which was a long time ago. I don't <laughs> and then think they I've moved ever them and we couldn't find them. And, I don't and now think we know I've where to find them. them so, to tell yeah. you the truth, though. And then Instagram, mm -hmm. all those filters. I never use any of those filters. Yeah. And I do some of the weird software, like Artisto and the cell phone stuff, like weird stuff I like. Yeah. But I've never, I don't usually use like the filters that change the, because you can do it in your own edit, like in Snapseed or something in the, in the. True. Yeah. In the on the phone, yeah. but in Photoshop you can do so much of that yeah. on your own. Well, they also have in the filter section, I forget what the category is, but they have an oil paint oh, filter, okay. which is pretty cool. I have uh, to, I yeah, have, just I last week I had with a, any of those. I had a photo that I really wanted to work well. I was in the Japanese garden up at Chicago Botanic and there were these giant Turkish Turkish Delight poppies. They were bigger than my spread out hand. They were they were huge and there was a whole grouping of them. But so many people had walked into the poppies that the garden had to put a rope to keep people from walking in, unfortunately. So I had to stand back and it was the sun was getting harsh. So I took a couple photos and I'm like, oh I you know, this isn't gonna work as a photo. But I went into the painting filters uh -huh. and was able to do a um, it was like a heavy textured. I saw that picture on yes. Facebook. You're right. Yeah. That was amazing. So that was in Photoshop. The paint filters. You paint can also, filter? if you have the, um, I think Topaz makes a filter. Topaz Impression, mm -hmm. I think. Topaz, yeah. Topaz Impression has some paint um, options too that you can go in there and then bring it back. I always want to fool around with that stuff. It just seems like I never. You just time. have to. You know what? It's like you're going down Alice's rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland, because you figure out, oh my gosh, it can Photoshop can do this, and then you look at your clock and four hours has passed. Yeah, so yeah, that's what happens to me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right, so let's go back to actually taking pictures of the flowers. What did we miss? I know you talked a little bit about the plant, but let's talk about. Um, photographing in the wind because sometimes it's going to be windy. Sometimes you just have to work with it and you might have more impression impressionistic photos. Just just work with it and let the wind blow and um, you can focus or not focus on the flower and and take your shot and that little subtle movement just it, it puts you into that scene at that time that it happened and I just find them to be beautiful impressionistic style photos okay. and sometimes when the wind isn't blowing I'll try to get my shutter speed as slow as possible and do um, ICM it stands for intentional camera movement and I'll actually jerk my camera while I'm taking the shot and um, that's what I do if there is no wind okay so I have a little um, cheat sheet that I keep in my bag if I find that I'm not being creative or I'm drawing a blank and I get to a situation where I just really don't know how to shoot it and I pull this out of my bag and I'm, you know you can do the documentary photo you could do the in-camera movement um, you can do shallow depth of field and, and a great way to practice with flower macro photography this is what I have my students do is go through all the apertures 
that okay. your lens allows. And then when you're at home sitting at your computer, you can see how aperture changes the feel of the photo. That's, yeah, that's So fun. sometimes I still do that. And just to see which yeah. might you might like better, right? And you think you want this at f two point eight, but then you look at it at f twenty two, and you're like, oh, I like this one better, right? Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, because you may you may want the whole flower in focus, but now the background is in focus too at f twenty two, so that would be a great case for adding a texture, okay. or taking that out of focus photo of the scene and using that as your texture. So you, you've got the light and the color of the scene, but you add in the blurriness, but you've got the whole flower in focus that way. So oh, you got, you so had many so many good, <laughs> I creative ideas, well, wow. A lot of it comes out of having problems, and then you find ways to work around your problems. And you know, what What did we do in photography before Google and YouTube? I, I know, mean, you can, right. you what can did we do without about, any, about anything? Yeah. Yesterday, my Google Mail, I went to mark something as unread, which is how I live. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always tell everybody, don't text me, don't Facebook message mm -hmm. me, email me, because I organize everything in my email. And the main thing is mark is unread, so that so I know that it's important. It. Mm -hmm. And it was gone. It was gone. Oh. I was like, oh my God, I get 400, 500 emails a day. I need that. Yeah. So I went on Google, oh my God. My mark is unread is gone. They mm -hmm. moved it. Still there. Oh, they okay, just good. moved it. <laughs> but if I didn't know, if I didn't have Google, yeah. I would have been like, yeah. oh my gosh, we where'd it go? Would have gone to the library, pulled out the Dewey <laughs> Decimal System, and <laughs> it's amazing what we can accomplish I, today. I, I Google everything, or yep. I or I ask Alexa. Okay. Because I have her at home. Yeah. I don't have her here. I couldn't say her name. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, so w did we miss anything? I'm trying to think of if we missed anything good. Now, what do you do with your flower photography? Um, I sell some pieces. Okay. I have one small installation. It's actually in an assisted living facility. They, they wanted calming, um, calming photos to put throughout for their residents, so they, they have a small hall that's decorated with my work, and they've, they've got other works throughout, but um, I would love to get into a hospital, um, mm -hmm. doctor's offices, um, things like that. That's, that's kind of my goal. I'd, I'd love to get into um, hotels and that. So I'm, I'm starting to do the work right now to get myself ready for those kind of sales. Um, but I do teaching right now. I, I love teaching. I have a degree in secondary education but I like photography more <laughs> and I like teaching people who really want to be there to learn what I have to teach. So um, I, I've done a workshop with another photographer and that was more of a photo tour, landscape photography. We just got back from that in um, April and it was so popular that we may be doing two back-to-back -back weeks mm -hmm. in April of 2020. So if anybody is interested. And where uh, is that? On, well, I'll be posting on my website as soon as we get it up. And so my website's julieleephoto.com and just go to my about section. And that's where I keep my upcoming um, Oh, but you don't know where you're going to go yet. Oh, it'll be the Desert Southwest. So we'll start in the Page, Arizona area and go up through Bluff and um, uh, we'll go into southern Utah okay. a little bit. So it's, it's that whole area. It, it's amazing the topography there and I find that I can get really creative um, with, you know, it's not just standard landscape photography. Um, I love teaching wide angle techniques with super wide lenses and fisheye lenses and um, I, I love to see how creative I can get in those situations as well. That's cool. How yeah. fun. Yeah. You got a lot going on. Well, yeah, I, I try to stay busy. You know, it keep, I find that if I sit back for a week or two weeks and I'm not shooting, that it just takes a little longer for me to jump back into it. So I'm, I'm always shooting something and it might even be in my backyard. I keep a cut flower garden in my backyard. So I, I'm never wanting for something to photograph. That's awesome. So. And flower photography seems like it would be so easy to photograph because you can just go to yeah. Costco or Trader Joe's, yeah. get some flowers, put them in a, you don't even need a lot of right. space. You, you don't even need a lot of friends. Light. You yeah. don't, 
Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot seems... of people like to do sunrise and sunset with somebody else because you're out after dark and you know you're putting groups of people together. It might rain. It you know the clouds may not appear for a beautiful sunset but with flower photography you can you can be in your home you could be recuperating from an injury and still you know from the seat of your desk chair you could sit there with your camera on a tripod and still still do your thing that's awesome that's awesome yeah. okay so julieleephotography.com no 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 <laughs> Because you'll end up at a portrait photographer in Wisconsin if you do that. So it's Julie Lee Photo. Julie Lee Photo dot com. Okay. And you can find me on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm Julie Lee USA. Okay. Um, usually it's duplicate of what I'm posting on Facebook, but I'm finding that more people are trending towards Instagram. Um, because it's more photography related, um, photo related, and less drama and what you had for dinner that day, like Facebook has become. But you know, Facebook has its uses. And, and as I well. think they're different audiences. I have yes. I have different audiences on my Instagram than I do with my Facebook. I have some of the same people, but I'm going to say like ten of the oh. same people. And but okay. I have totally different audiences. It's True. weird. Yeah. It's a much younger crowd on Instagram and an older crowd on Facebook in general. But so I do the yeah. same thing. I try to post on yeah. both. I actually just took a class on Instagram for creatives. Okay. And I haven't put much of it to use yet, but it was just a couple weeks ago. But I've got a whole list of things to promote your work. So I, I have two markets. I have the educational market, and then I have the market that I want to sell to. Art, so yeah. you know, keywording or hashtagging, hashtagging your yeah. photos mm -hmm. so that they get to the market that you want it to uh, get to is very important on Instagram because people search by those hashtags. They sure do. Well, join our Facebook group, Selling Your Photography is Art. I just too. did last week. Okay. Yes, I got <laughs> an invitation from you, oh, so thank right. you for the invite. <laughs> yes. I, I just need to participate. <laughs> that's I need to be home to participate. I know. So. Life is busy, it, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. All right, so julieleephoto.com, and if you don't remember that, she lives in Orlando, so Julie yeah. Lee Photographer Orlando it, might work right. if you're just doing a search. Yes. And you're, and you're heavily involved in the Orlando Camera Club, right? Correct, yes. I'm so a, that's another way to find you yep. if people forget the thing. It's all going to be in our show notes, but still, okay. you know how yes. people are. I, I listen to podcasts in the car. I do too. And yep. I always mean to go back and, mm -hmm. and look at the show notes, mm -hmm. and sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I just go, oh, yeah. who was that guy or that lady? Oh, it was Julie Lee. Julie. And I just yeah. start looking, yeah. you know, without doing the proper well, that's what research. I do on planes too. I'll download the podcast to my phone and then as I'm listening I have um, the notes section on my iPhone open and I'm sitting there typing. Um, I, have a, I have a note called look up when you have time ah, and it's notes that. from the different podcasts. It might be a website, it might be a photographer that I don't want to learn more about uh, I, but I just make myself a list and then and I find that I have time and an internet connection, then great there idea. you go. That's a great idea. Well, thank so, you for being on the show yeah, again. Thank I you so much it. for having me again. Thanks for yes. coming down. I always enjoy coming to Naples. Hey, <laughs> good <yes>. thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, audience, if you would leave us on a review on iTunes, we would really, 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 really appreciate it. I am looking into trying to figure out how to get a direct link to the review section on iTunes, but it's not, it's not that easy, believe it or not. I don't know why they make it so difficult, but uh, I'm working on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so hopefully that will be in the show notes by the time you, you get to them. If you have any sub suggestions for topics or guests for the Understand Photography Show, let me know. Or even if you have ideas for topics for our Tuesday photo tips. Remember, we put out a short video on YouTube every Tuesday. So it's a short little tip on something photography every Tuesday. And then the Understand Photography Show comes out on Fridays at 4 p.m. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next Friday. Get up!